Thank you, Jane. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Fantastic to actually uh, see so many of you come out this morning, especially given what the subject is that we're looking at. Obviously, some of you didn't read ahead to see that we were talking about this thing of making our faith known. Had you seen that? Probably some of us would have thought, oh, no. Don't want to be made feel guilty about that. I'll say that. I'm there. Thank you very much. No, I can use the weather as an excuse. But you're here, so good on you. Really good that you're here. The coronavirus has dominated uh, the headlines uh, in recent weeks. New and troubling viruses usually uh, originate from animal hosts, you're probably aware of that, like the one which started in Wuhan in China. Ebola was another example of that. Uh, that's actually way back in 2002, uh, really. SARS spread virtually unchecked to about 37 countries, causing global panic, infecting more than 8,000 people and killing more than 700 and 50. This new coronavirus causes pneumonia. Those who've fallen ill are either reported to suffer from coughs or from fever or breathing difficulties. China's National Health Commission has then confirmed that there is human to human transition and that's what's caused and created a lot of concern. There's been similar cases uh, elsewhere and you may well have heard one uh, down at, uh, in Taunton. Uh, the few known to have the virus in the UK have been placed in quarantine. Why? Because they've been deemed highly infectious. Now, of course, when we think about that whole uh, concept of being infectious in that way, that's both very alarming and it's incredibly uh, tragic. However, as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are called to be infectious in a positive way. <laughs> Way before this uh, coronavirus has hit the news, we had today as our theme for this week, couple of months uh, planned uh, ago, about let's be become infectious. We've been going through a whole host of different values as what is important for us as church so that we might see God clearly in what we're calling for our theme for the year 2020 vision, see God clearly. So how is it that we might be infectious in such a positive way, whereby others may be coming to contact with you and me and can't help but catch that which we have got? That's going to be what we're going to be exploring this, uh, this morning. It was late 1980 and there was a teenager who looked out for the first time ever at a church service that he went to. The church, this particular church, was packed. There was about 650 people there. He was absolutely staggered. Reflecting afterwards, he remembers confessing to others, I have no idea what it is that they've got, but whatever it is, I've not got it. Interesting phrase. What those people had was Jesus Christ. How do I know? Why am I so confident that that story is reliable? Well, because I was that teenager in 1980, and I can still remember looking out from the upstairs balcony on this incredible scene as people, God's people, were worshipping this God. I had no idea what planet they were from or what they were on, but I didn't have what they had. And that started uh, my search. It could well be that you're on that kind of search yourself. Uh, and you've uh, been led here this morning, or you've got questions and that kind of stuff. You're in the, the right place. So I want to say a special uh, welcome uh, to you as well. What was it about that group of people way back when? Well, they were obviously contagious. There was something that they had caught. I mentioned about our theme uh, for this morning. Uh, merely the mention of that word, uh, we believe in witnessing, uh, can create maybe a cringe for some of us uh, as what we're maybe being asked to do, or maybe for other of us in our minds, we think of certain groups going around uh, door knocking, or we think, well, it's, it's not really for me, it's for the extroverts, etc., etc. It, it can create a whole host of different uh, fearful emotions. Let's just kind of park those emotions to one side because we're wired up differently so it's not that we're all to be exactly the same here but what is important in those verses that we've just had read to us from Matthew chapter 4 and that incredible uh, scene of those those first few disciples that as soon as Jesus said come follow me that was it they did 
there was a sense of urgency as they cast their nets aside and just followed this Jesus. And then when Jesus came back from the dead, he said to that first group of his followers, you will be my witnesses. And that's something that's a mandate for each and every one of us. He didn't say anything about the way we had to do that. He didn't say anything about the sort of personality type that we needed to become. Just as you, make this you, if you're a follower of Jesus, well, you will be my witness. And I hope that takes some of the pressure uh, off of maybe be, uh, feeling what you need to be a particular type of person. And our mission is to be infectious. I wonder if we know that or if we've forgotten. Why is it that we're here uh, as a church? Well, when we have a straw poll about that, uh, there's a, a number of people, usually in the majority actually, would say, we're here for worship. Well, of course we're here for worship, uh, and that's great, it sounds good. After all, it's the first uh, commandment, isn't it? That sense of the importance of worship. But actually, we should be worshiping God 24 seven, not just for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. We have that opportunity to worship God through the way that we live our lives, don't we? In actual fact, the main purpose for church, if you read Acts, Acts chapter 2, was so that this message that that hodgepodge group of first followers of Jesus received might then be made known to others. That they might be able to speak in a language that the people out there were able to understand. That was the context for the first church and the purpose and mission of the church, to my knowledge, remains unchanged. We are to be his witnesses in some shape or form. We spend a lot of time, uh, don't we, in, uh, in meetings, and if you're involved in the church here, there's a lot of meetings that go on. All of those may well be uh, important, but if the meetings don't contribute to what our mission is about, and here we've got a strap line uh, that says what? What's our, the seven words that sum up what our mission is about as a church? Oh, great. <laughs> okay. You know what's coming up in the next couple of months then, now. What's it? Thank you. Round of applause, please, for Joy White over there. The only person in our membership of 150 that knows what on earth we're here for. Slightly depressing. If you're watching this online, I hope that you knew already. Celebrating and sharing the love of God. Maybe I need to unpack that a little bit more. When Jesus was asked what was most important of all, he said, about, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all you are, in other words. That's where the celebrating bit comes from. And we use chocolate as an excuse for that. The sharing is love. Comes from what Mandy in her prayer has already alluded to, that great commission in Matthew 28, to go and make disciples. So there's the greatest commandment and the greatest commission that are wrapped up in those seven words. And it seems like we're going to need to revisit that. So that's our mission in practical terms, in terms of how we live and through what we say. The urgency ought to be that we're seeking to leave our nets cast, whatever it is aside, so we seek to be those people. So our mission is to be infectious, but we're also needed to be a people who are willing to accept what that mission is. Is it just for others to be involved? No. Uh, being infectious doesn't mean that we're meant to be loud. Sometimes we've got the image of the person that's on the street corner uh, shouting out on, uh, from their, their soapbox the need to be saved and, and other uh, very um, helpful phrases uh, to turn or burn that are not particularly palatable in today's uh, climate, maybe. But Jesus did nonetheless command his followers to go wherever we should. People need the gospel, that good news of Jesus. Therefore, we ought to do our part in enabling them to hear and to understand, particularly if this Jesus we believe in, we say we believe in, but we need to believe what he actually said. When Paul wrote to one church at Rome in chapter 10, verse 14, he said, how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And that was a valid question for Paul. And it's also uh, maybe the best thing that we can do in terms of giving a taster, isn't it, of God's love. That in some shape or form, people might have that opportunity to hear something of that great hope that we have. Now, how is it that we can do that in terms of sharing our faith? And we're not just thinking about doing good deeds, but I'm sure uh, that would be something that you can think of. But as you spend 25 seconds sharing that with somebody that you feel comfortable to share with next to you or in and around you, 
how you might uh, share your faith. I'm going to just already say doing good things. Now nobody can say that. Go. You've got 25 seconds starting now. And then we'll see a video. Great that you've got all the answers. I could just say, well, just go and do whatever it is that you've been chatting about. I'm sure we could do with some pointers. Uh, so here, a little bit of a, a, a break here. Here's maybe some pointers if technology is in our favour as to how we might share our faith. Let's do it together. So there you go. There's some very easy, clear pointers, perfectly palatable and sensitive. Maybe not. Okay, we're going to think a little bit this evening about recognising our mission is not yet complete and about praying to be infectious in uh, our mission. Uh, it's interesting that we pray for non-believers to be saved, yet there is not a single Bible verse that relates to that. There is, of course, Bible verses where we can quote where God's people are saying, would you give us the courage to share that which we believe? Now, it's not that we shouldn't maybe pray for those we love and know who don't maybe know God, but rather, I think sometimes we can use that as a bit of a bottle wave to be the witnesses that we've been called to be. God expects us to be infectious. Back in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 8, God's people en masse said then, we will do whatever the Lord has said. Now, if you read the context of what went on, they didn't. But let's just put that to one side, because that was then. We may well say as well, if, if the question I was to ask you this morning, shall we do what God said? You know, there's only one answer. It's a, it's a naff question, really, because you know you have to say, yes, we'll do what God said. Well, what do we read? Well, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Acts chapter 1. You will tell everyone about me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and everywhere in the world. Jerusalem was their own community. Think about that in your own situation. Judea was their own country. Samaria was those of a different culture. Everywhere in the world was just as it said on the tin. Those four groups are equally important. Now, probably me, like you, we've got a natural uh, bias towards one, haven't we? The, the first one, those that we know, those in our immediate um, uh, radius, which is understandable. It's okay so long as we recognise the importance of our seeking, as God's people as a whole, of reaching the other three groups. We know it's not PC to be uh, discriminate, so we shouldn't, even in our evangelism, in our outreach, in our seeking to make known. Uh, this Jesus that we believe in. And a couple of weeks start on, uh, next Sunday, I think uh, it, it is, so um, this is a, a cue for you to not come, uh, because we're thinking about giving and money next week, so uh, <laughs> uh, we don't expect uh, more than a handful to be here. Uh, so there you go, that's the heads up. There you go, definitely feel you've got to come. There's a bit of wrestling going on within already. But even in terms of, of our giving here, uh, where a number of people think of the, the whole sense of tithing, 10%, right? whatever portion, I'm going to give that to God's work. Whatever we receive in as a church, we hope and pray God, by God's grace, we seek to give away that same kind of 10%. Why? So that we are, are kind of like giving to God's mission and cause out there with no expectation of getting anything back, but because we want to be committed to the groups that's out there that as yet maybe do not know this Jesus as Lord. Up to this point, I, I dare say that there are times where many of us have felt that we haven't been that infectious with our faith or about our faith uh, at all. Uh, if I was to ask the question, well, and I won't, so don't put your hands up, but uh, the question as to, well, who this morning has come here as who's not normally a church going person as a result of your being infectious this week or mine? And we would probably think, I don't want to capture a design right now. <laughs> but let me uh, help you feel better. Nobody is here this morning from outside the church as a result of me. Nothing. Nobody at all. Now I'm only saying that just so that it kind of releases that guilt factor that so often it strikes me that we can uh, feel. Tell God how you feel. It doesn't take away from that, that command or that mandate that we've been given. But tell God about your fears, about your struggles, about maybe that guilt thing, because that's where the enemy is going to want to get down. Acknowledge maybe that we could have done better 
or feel that we maybe don't, just don't know what uh, to say or maybe we lack confidence to speak out, let alone to share our faith. Maybe as a prayer, Lord, forgive me for not having been obedient to you regarding my being a witness. Give me that sense of boldness and a greater sense of urgency to make Jesus known. It's a good, positive prayer. Repeat it. Ask him for help as to where you are at in terms of how you might be the most effective witness as you, not as anybody else, but as you. Seek opportunities to actually be infectious. Here might be a few. I'm at work today, God. How can I be used by you here? I'm bringing a friend to an event at church. What's the next thing they may well be interested in? We're at a neighbour's social. How can I bring something in? If it's uh, okay, if it's reasonable and sensitive, how can I do that about my faith? There's an, eth an ethical issue that's being discussed in, in a group I'm in. How can I make my views known from my own faith standpoint? It's nearly Sunday. Who is it that I might be able to invite that I don't normally to, to church? That was a great book that I read about how God's changed an indiv individual's life. I wonder who that might be appropriate for. You can think about other such questions in terms of what happens a day in, day out in your own lives. And it's about how we might be open for God to use those things every single day. Paul said this to the church at Philippi, don't think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too. Elsewhere to the church at Corinth, he said, I don't think about what would be good for me, but what would be good for many people so that they might be saved. What's next? What's next? What's next? Ought to be the sort of questions that we have percolating around in our minds. Paul was quite harsh on himself. He said, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. That was his feeling about his calling. Your calling may well be different, but a part of every Christian's calling is that we ought to, at the very least, seek to be a witness for Jesus. Of course, the reality is that we are already one. It's whether or not we're a positive one or a negative one. And there are times where we blow it, aren't there? You know, and then probably we hear much to our shame, somebody saying under their breath, call yourself a Christian. I won't ask for a hands up at this point. I mean, oh, but we're human. It's okay. It's acknowledge we make mistakes. But we're still called to be a, a witness and seek to make the most of every opportunity. Woe to me, maybe, if I don't seek to make Jesus known. I can become infectious. And this can happen at the most bizarre times as well. I want to give you just one illustration. I shared this with uh, in Cafe uh, Church yesterday. Some of you <laughs> may well have seen on Facebook because Rich put, uh, put a picture there. Um, I, I've been invited to be the chaplain of the fire service. They're based up at Cambry. Uh, my big concern is my time, but it's only about an hour and a fortnight. So I, I said yes and uh, had a meeting and was in the uniform that you can see uh, uh, on Facebook and I'm stood quite deliberately next to the engine that says as their mission statement for the fire service, passionate about changing and saving lives. <laughs> I like that. That's evidently better than ours. <laughs> and I have no idea uh, what may well come uh, of that uh, at all. Uh, there's uh, someone else who's just retired from that post, great guy called Chris Warren, who oversees a chaplaincy. Uh, in the town. Chris is retired, he's had a lot of health problems, he's done this for about five years. Uh, so this was my first opportunity on Wednesday night to meet some of these guys and I'd been warned about the levels of humour and all that kind of stuff. I thought, that's okay, I'm used to that with the elders, so that's fine. <laughs> and, um, so I, I'm not knowing what to expect, I'm thinking, like, what are they going to have in mind? for chaplain, you know, religious guy, you know, completely disconnected with reality. So there's about a dozen of us as they shared coffee at the end of the night. So, you know, tell me, why don't you tell me that this thing, chaplain, what does that conjure up mind in, you know, into your mind? So they went around and shared a couple of things and that was fine, there was a good bit of banter, which is okay. And then the, the chief guy uh, there, he said, well, I've got two questions for you. 
And I have to be honest, I thought, well, this is going to be what football team do you support? Or, you know, do you have to wear a, a, a dress on a Sunday? And that kind of stuff. <laughs> Two questions. His first question, do you believe in aliens? <laughs> I said, come along to church and meet a whole bunch of them. <laughs> and that was their response. That was okay. So we chatted a little bit about what might be out there and that kind of stuff. Uh, but alongside that, he said, I said, well, what's your other question? He said, do you believe in ghosts? I thought, oh, there's, a, there's a whole big answer about that. Now, I had no idea that that was going to come up. Now, okay, this is my first time there, so I want to be a bit not over heavy with anybody needing exorcism, hang about <laughs> after coffee. That didn't seem appropriate. But you just never know when something out of the blue may well pop up and come up in conversation. God's Word says in 1 Peter that we all ought to be ready with an answer when someone comes up with a question for that hope that we have. We might not feel that we know all the answers, and that came out yesterday and Saturday, and it's okay to say, don't. It's a lot better to say, I don't know, than come out with some cliche naff response or a trite response to suffering about, well, Adam and Eve got it wrong, made a wrong, wrong decision, so there's suffering and death. That does not help someone who's asking that question from a position of their own pain because a loved one is dying of cancer. But we're still called to be a witness, to begin to start where that person is, enter with them into their pain. A couple of things maybe to, to just finish as, as we close. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit, don't we? It isn't about us. When questions that very often are quite complex or difficult or we feel this is beyond us, it is not about us. One of the great encouragements that Jesus gave his own followers was he said, don't worry about when the questions get asked because at that moment, then my Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Some of you will have known those times where something was asked or you were involved in a particular conversation and without you even knowing it or planning it, something came out and you thought, whoa, that was pretty good. Where did that come from? Trust that God will give you that which you need at that given time. And if you get it a bit wrong or not quite right, it is okay. Shall I tell you why? Because God is more than able to compensate for your errors and my errors and the times that we blow it. Because we worship a big God. He's already on that case. If he involves us in it, brilliant. Just have to allow yourselves to be used at whatever level and then move on. We need to rely on God's Holy Spirit and openness to him that enables us to be more like God. And if we're more like God, obviously we're going to have more of a heart for his world. God so loved the world, didn't he? So he's going to love the individual that we're involved in communicating with. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul said there to a church, God has given us his spirit. That's why we don't think the same way that the people of the world think. Maybe this morning we need to afresh ask for that sense of a fresh openness to his spirit upon us and within us. So we're less caught up with what we have to make happen, how we need to be. Because if we, if we go too far the other way, that's going to be reliant on our own strength, skill set, abilities. That's not going to get us anywhere. How many people were ever pushed into the kingdom of God? I can remember seeking to do that as a pumped up new convert in my late teens. No good. Upset and annoyed a load of people. And if there was anybody ticking a box, then I would have because it wasn't a God thing. Let's be open to God having his way in and through us. It's his work after all, isn't it? But it's our responsibility to be open to him. It's my responsibility to say, God, would you fill me afresh? <coughs> God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Ask him maybe to place the spiritual need of unbelievers in your mind. Because that's where the world starts, isn't it? Where that person is and your connection with them. And one other thing maybe, it's useful to focus, we need an eternal perspective. I dare say you woke up this morning 
and you pull back the curtains and you assess the weather situation and then you wondered whether or not your neighbour to that door down was going to a lost eternity. Probably not. <laughs> we think about the things of breakfast and getting up and getting ready and taking a look in the mirror and then wishing we didn't. And all the stuff like that that's <laughs> in our minds on the here and now that we can see, feel, touch. God's word points us towards us having an eternal perspective. I can't remember the, the phrase, I didn't have a pen to write down what, what Mandy said, quoting Mandy again uh, this morning. But there was something of that eternal perspective. And I thought, wow, that's great, because that's where I want us to end this morning. Our culture focuses very much on the here and now. Now that is important. It's important for ourselves as a church as well to make a difference in the here and now, to be sort and light, to do all that good stuff. Yes, of course, that's important but not to the extent that we forget that what matters most are where, where people are spending eternity. Because the day in, day out stuff that we give so much of our time and energy and, dare I say it, financial resources to, we can't take with us. It's not going to last. There's only one thing, isn't there, that ultimately matters. And it's whether or not people have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ or not. Isn't that right? Mm. Yeah. Yes, Roger, it is. Thank you. <laughs> God's word says this. Again, this is Paul speaking to a church. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Think about your average day, your average week, your average month. Maybe if you dare, think about doing that kind of time type study as to the things that are do to do with this world and the percentage of my time that are focusing on my having an eternal perspective. I kind of did a rough outline of that for me this week. Kind of wished I hadn't, if I'm honest. <laughs> but it alerted me the fact that the majority of my focus, my time, my prayer is all to do with the here and now. It's important that maybe we think of that eternal perspective. Not just for yourself if you're a believer and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ either. Because I have to invite anybody who's unsure about that eternal question to ask you that right now. And although we jest about the, if you die tonight, where would you go? It is a question that, however insensitive to just ask and put somebody on the spot maybe, it is a question that each of us, when we have our own time between ourselves and our maker, mm -hmm. need to make sure that we've got an answer. Because we don't know when we're going to breathe our last breath, do we? Mm -hmm. Someone mentioned in celebrations about a celebrity who sadly took their own life. I don't know their eternal state. What I do know is this. Whatever the decision was that they had made in this life, it's too late to do anything in praying for them now. Because after death, there's a judgment. It's during this life that we have the opportunity to make a decision for or not for Jesus Christ. At this point, one or two, probably it strikes me like the phrase, I'm just sitting on the fence. Try telling God that. Can I tip you off? There is no fence. If you haven't made a decision that's, yes, Jesus, I am a sinner. I have failed you and I deserve a lost eternity. But would you forgive me because I believe that this Jesus, your son, gave his life when he died on that cross for me. I deserve to be punished, but God's love said, hey, I'm going to take it all in Jesus. And I'm trusting that for all I've got. Help me to change. Help me to follow you. Help me to be the person that you want me to be right now. You can make that prayer your own. So whether or not this thing of believing and witnessing is our own sense of being encouraged afresh to be used in our own particular situation that we find ourselves 
Or it's forced us to think about, well, if somebody asked me what's my story about how I came to faith and why I know that I've got this assurance, and I'm thinking, I don't. Whichever group we're in, God wants to meet you where you are right now. <coughs> Isn't that what Jesus did when he walked this earth? He started with people where they were, not where he wanted them to end up. That is so important. Trust that this God, as you invite this God to open up your own heart and mind to him. Say, God, wherever I'm at, would you meet me at that place in the here and now? If you'd like someone to pray for you this morning, Paul uh, and Maria, I know, are here this morning. They oversee our prayer ministry team. They'll gladly direct you to someone. They're not going to at all end up with or say, well, this is where you've got to end. They're going to just ask you, say, well, what can we do for you? How can we pray for you? And whatever that is, sometimes there's a benefit in ourselves receiving prayer from others that they will connect and, and join hands with us before God in terms of what that individual may well be seeking. Let's pray. And I'm going to say a prayer that I hope, regardless of the people group that we feel we are a part of, uh, that something of this would be appropriate for you. I'm going to pray uh, in the me sense as if this is uh, me. And without uttering words out loud, if any of this resonates for you, why not reflect these words to the God who knows your heart and knows how you're responding to him right now. And then Martin and the group will come to lead us as we have an opportunity to respond in worship. Dear God, thank you for this moment to take space and time out. To think about why I'm here. God, thank you that you love me so much that even if I was the only person here, your good news of Jesus would be just as real and relevant for me. Because of my own wrongdoing and having failed you, I know I need your forgiveness and I can't earn that just simply by being good because wrong needs to be punished. Jesus, thank you for being willing to be punished in my place. I don't get it. I don't understand why you love me that much, but I want to say thank you. Would you forgive me, God? Would you help me to believe? Would you help me in my doubts? And would you help me understand what it means to follow this Jesus? God, for me, I would call myself a Christian, I would call myself a follower of Jesus, and I've heard again your words saying, you will be my witness. Mm -hmm. Forgive me for those times when I've just not really liked that bit and not really done it. Forgive me for my fears. Forgive me for maybe leaving that bit of my faith to other people. I know that you've made me the way you've made me is a reason. Would you put in my path people that I can relate to, people that I can just be me with, that through me being open to you, they might capture something of what it means to have a relationship with you. Help me to become infectious. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'd love to chat with anybody who'd like to uh, <coughs> share further about that and uh, think further about that. And if you think about anything by way of a, a mission opportunity as a church, we've got one that's been handed to us for an event in Borough Gardens that's been handed to us on a plate that's a community event uh, coming up in a few weeks' time. One of our ways in would be if there's anybody that's artistic, <coughs> particularly, that can paint faces in terms of face painting. If that's you, or you think you could lend your hand to that, that's going to be an open door for us to do and share some of the other stuff we do uh, in church life at this uh, event in Barragan. So if that's you, then please do speak to myself 
or on one of the other uh, routes.